you know what a Valkyrie is, or at the very least you think you know what a Valkyrie is, and you have found yourself here in my tavern. So why don't I regale you with the tales of the Norse maidens of death, and their secrets, and their romances, and how they seem to be still having an influence over the cultural battlefield of today. So, grab a seat, grab a drink, and don't worry about the stories. Those are always on the house. If you've never heard of Valkyries or you've passed through a magic portal to find yourself here in the tavern, allow me to give you a brief history of Norse myths so you are caught up with the rest of the class. Now, you may have said to yourself, why should I care about Valkyries? Or you probably care about them very much. Even more so, you might be saying, where do they come from? I don't know if any of you are actually asking these questions. This is a hypothetical situation, so put your hands down and wait till the end for questions. Now, Valkyries are warrior maidens in the service of the All-Father of the Aesir, Odin. And those were a whole lot of words I said that some people may not understand, so let's go into that. In Norse mythology, there are essentially three primary groups, and they're all more or less different tribes who are constantly combating and conflicting with each other, and none of them particularly like each other very much. At the top of the pile, you have the Aesir. This is the clan of Odin, and they dwell in the mystical and beautiful realm of Asgard. This includes figures like Odin, Thor, Baldur, and Tyr. Thor and Tyr and Odin are all gods of war. Thor is a god of agriculture, though he's often referred to as a god of thunder. And Baldur is a god of beauty and longevity and ruining everyone's vacation. And these guys are one group of what are considered gods in Norse mythos. Then there are the other guys who are essentially the tree huggers of Norse myth. And they are the Vanir and they exist in the beautiful fields of the realm of Vanaheim, which is ruled over by Njordr, who is the lord of the sea, his daughter Freya, who is the goddess of beauty and love, and her brother Freyr, who is also a god of beauty, but from the other end of the spectrum, and fertility. Freya also has a thing for cats and men of smaller stature. And these two groups fight a lot. And I mean a lot, a lot. That is, of course, until the third group enters the fray, and those are the Jotnar of Jotunheim. They are often called giants because of their immense strength, but not always because of their immense stature, though some of them do have immense stature, and really anything monstrous. The trolls, the large monster creatures, the gigantic wolf, the big snake, the six-legged horse, these are all considered to be Jotnar. There's even a giant eagle who likes to eat people who is also considered to be a Jotun. And anyways, the only time that the Aesir and the Vanir decide that they can get along is when they both decide that they should kill off all of the Jotnar, and the Jotnar also don't like this. But this agreement, this truce and treaty between the Aesir and Vanir, isn't even actually reached until the smartest man in all the realms is beheaded when he tries to make peace between the two of them. And even that doesn't give him peace from all of the fighting between the Aesir and the Vanir, because Odin has the absolute audacity to bring his head back to life and keep it alive in a box of flowers so that it can still give him advice even though it has died. And that is of course the story of Mimir, but that is a tale for another time. Anyways, the two of these groups make peace and decide that they are gonna kill off all the Jotnard. That is of course until Odin, Lord of all, here is a prophecy that the Jotnar will someday bring about the death of him, his children, and everything that he has worked for his life to build. And don't get me wrong, the Jotnar did have some nasty characters, and they really, really, really did want to see Odin die. So where do the Valkyries fit into all of this drama? Well, you see, eventually Odin becomes the self-proclaimed king of the gods, and when he realizes that there is a prophecy for him to die, he wants to build up an army as big as possible, so no matter how powerful and how big the beasts are that come after him, he can be ready. 
So he sets to work a group of warrior women who decide the fates of the battlefield, and they are called the Valkyrie, or the Valkar. And they collect men who come into Valhalla, Volhall in the Old Norse, to train as bodyguards for Odin, personal guard, to ensure that the big bad puppy dog and the big bad snake don't come in and kill him and his son. And how are these Einherjargaten? Well, <laughs> the Valkyries go down to battlefields and they collect and kill the best of the warriors and bring them back to Valhalla to serve in probably one of the worst examples of drafted warriors in the history of mythology. I guess there is a little condolence because they get to train all the time, drink and eat endlessly in Odin's Hall, and then they all go out into the field at the end of every day, kill each other, and then are resurrected back in the hall. So, good times, I suppose. But let's get back to the Valkyrie. Their name, in and of itself, is broken into two Old Norse words. You have Valar, which means slain, or to be slain, and then you have Kjosa, which means to choose. So their name literally means choosers of the slain. And their job, as I mentioned, is to go to the battlefield, select the bravest and strongest of the warriors, see them dead, and bring their souls back to Valhalla. Now, in spite of their popularity, the Valkyries actually don't appear all that often, relatively speaking, in the sagas and the Adas. Now, if you don't know what a saga or an Ada is, the Adas are the two broad collections of documents. The first is the Snorra Edda, which was written by Snorri Sturluson, often called the Younger or the Prose Edda. Wasn't really a history book, more of a handbook for young poets in Iceland to learn how to write poetry in Icelandic prose. And then the later compilation is called the Poetic Edda or the Elder Edda, and it's a collection of old documents that recorded poems and songs and stories as they were. Sagas, on the other hand, are broken up into a few different types, and these are supposed to recount the semi-mystical actions of real and semi-real people from the various legends and tales of Norse mythology. Some are people we know existed, and most are people that we can neither confirm or deny that they existed. Oh, I did all that in one breath. But in spite of the fact that the Valkyries don't appear very often in these tales, they have always been a very popular figure. We get a list of them in Grimnis Mal, and we get a, some of their story in Gilfagening. The most prominent of which are in Eric's saga and in the Volsun saga, where we get the romance of Valkyries alongside warriors. The most famous of which being the romance of Brynhildar and Sigurd the hero and the former being about three Valkyries that fall in love with some warriors, but then have to run away from those warriors, they turn into swans and fly away, and then the warriors spend the rest of their days traveling throughout all of the realms trying to find them, and it's very sad, like all romances are in Norse mythology. <laughs> and there are about half a dozen other mentions of them, but they're always noted as being the deciders of combat, and we never actually see them in combat themselves. There is an implication that they were ready for combat, and they are often said to decide the outcomes of battles, but we never actually get any prose saying that they are actually fighting. And the only thing we get close to is in the sagas, where the primary person in the saga claims that Valkyries came and fought on their behalf, which, you know. However, that aside, the absolute most incredible and epic mention of the Valkyries and what they do come to us from Njal's saga. And it might not be the best, but I like it a lot because it is the absolute most metal description of what Valkyries do in all of the documents that we have historical for Norse mythology. Allow me to read to you a little excerpt from this. Blood rains from the cloudy web on the broad loom of slaughter. The web of man, gray as armor, is now being woven. The Valkyries will cross it with a crimson weft. The warp is made of human entrails. Now, if you are not poetically inclined, allow me to tell you what is being said there. This is essentially describing the roles of Valkyries as sowing the fates of warrior men by using a gigantic 
loom made of the viscera and entrails of humans, and different parts of their bodies being used on this giant loom to weave the fabric of their fate. Oh, so incredibly metal. And with that all being said, their primary role is to be the choosers of the fate of the warrior. They choose who will live, who will die, who wins, and who loses. Now at first they were maids who served Odin. They were known for bringing drink and food to the tables and ferrying men across the sea like psychopomps, meant to guide warriors into Valhall. And then, over time, they would gain some shamanistic characteristics, being uh, wizard figures who would be gone to for advice. One figure of the Valkyries would even be among the Norns who control fate like the fates from Greek mythology. And then they would become more humanized. They would gain lovers, and they would have deeper backstories, and there would be more about the interactions between them as they were incorporated into the sagas in the later histories of Norse mythos. And eventually, in the late medieval period, their popularity in literature and myth just sort of dies out. As the rise of Christianity came over Western Europe, these figures would sort of fade away from a lot of writings. But they would get a resurgence in the 18th century and get a really big lift up in the 1800s with tons of writings and songs and art pieces. Most of the art pieces and songs and works we have today actually come from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, specifically and probably most prominently with the work of Wagner. Now, a lot of people don't like to acknowledge Wagner's influence over Norse and Nordic culture, because he was a bit of a bastard and he's not very well liked, justifiably so. But the influence of his work is undeniable. And he and other German and French artists would make most of what we have today as being depictions of the Valkyries. The only historical depictions, as in ancient history depictions we have of Valkyries, have them being cupbearers, as I mentioned early on. There are a couple of rune stones that show them bringing cups to warriors who are coming into Valhalla, welcoming them into their new home. And of course, the 21st century would see a massive resurgence in the popularity of the iconography of the Valkyrie. There are video games, comic books, movies, manga, anime, novels, and they are even popular in modern art, with trends on social media of people dressing up as Valkyries and shield maidens. They may have been feared, revered deeply in their days, and most men probably never would have, would have been greeted by a Valkyrie because of the sheer terror that they represented. But nowadays, they're basically a pop band. Now obviously, I could go on and on about Valkyries for days and days. Their many tales, their insane evolution over time, their representation in modern storytelling, there is so much to tell. But my friends, I'm afraid it will have to wait for another story. So until next time, my friends, I bid you stay bloodthirsty. And I hope you found this fascinating.